one of flying's oldest dreams had been to take off and land vertically. types of aircraft, the most versatile is the helicopter. It's been a great lifesaver, but its most far-reaching impact has been seen on the battlefield. The helicopter has added to Army's firepower. It has made the soldier more mobile. Such military potential was only a dream when the pioneers of vertical flight struggled to get airborne. Many of the early attempts were ingenious but bizarre. The spinning rotors created forces which were difficult to control. In 1924, Raul Pescara overcame some of the problems by using two sets of four rotors revolving in opposite directions. It could hover, it could fly forward at eight miles per hour for over 700 meters and rise to a height of 30 feet, but it was difficult to control and eventually crashed. Louis Breger of France hinged the rotor blades of his gyroplane using universal joints. It was far more controllable than previous helicopters, but the rotors still turned in opposite directions. And in 1935, this arrangement brought disaster. The idea of hinging the rotor blades originated with Juan de la Sierva, the Spanish pioneer. He invented another type of aircraft with a rotary wing, the autogyro. As well as a propeller, it had a rotor overhead which turned freely due to the forward motion of the aircraft. Its takeoff and landing run were very short, but it could not hover over a fixed point. The future of the Autogyro looked promising. It seemed to be the ideal popular aircraft. Senor Juan de la Sierra was a Spaniard who wanted to build an aeroplane that wouldn't stall. That was his original thought, I think. And he realized that if the wings could be made to go round and round, that they would maintain speed. And uh, if they glided around in the same way the sycamore seed does, that they wouldn't stop, even though the aeroplane was stationary. He made a number of experiments, but he quickly realized one thing was that the blade that is going forward through the air on this, this aeroplane with a rotary wing would have to be allowed to climb or to somehow compensate for the fact that it was giving more lift than the blade that was going backwards through the air. And he eventually developed what we now call the articulated rotor head, which is the key to success of the helicopter. He really solved most of the problems that would otherwise have beset the helicopter. Once the riddle of the helicopter had been solved, interest in the Autogyro declined. But today, Ken Wallace has taken up Sierva's dream. I see the Autogyro as the smallest practical working aircraft. The small scale appeals to me. The fact that in minutes it can be on a trailer behind the car, taken to a site 
where one needs to operate. But it can lift three times its own weight, which is a tremendous weight ratio. And this little machine could fly for 11 hours non-stop if one were prepared to put up with the noise and discomfort. Autogyro's greatest asset is it is completely stable, naturally stable, and it's possible to fly the autogyro in such a relaxed manner that you can attend to another task, which is the primary task of the mission. The other quite important thing is that if the engine should stop, then the rotors still keep turning. It doesn't mean that it stays up because you've got to look for somewhere to land it, but at least the rotors still keep turning. I think the autogyro hasn't had the success of the helicopter uh, in the post-30s because uh, the helicopter could do so many tricks that the autogyro couldn't do. It can actually take off vertically and it can land vertically and obviously it can hover and go sideways and backwards and so forth. But you do pay a very big price for that. I believe that the autogyro is a, a member of the family of aircraft. It doesn't have to compete with a helicopter. It fits in as part of the family. The first practical helicopter incorporating all the pieces of the puzzle was German. The FA-61 was built by Heinrich Fokker in 1936. Its two articulated rotors were mounted on outriggers on either side of the fuselage. Hannah Reich was one of the test pilots. I asked to make a circle and I put the plane in the middle. I could look to see the wheel. Now, when giving gasoline, I saw when the stick wasn't just in the middle, the wheel went forward. And when, when I went the stick a little bit backwards, the wheel went backwards. So when I found, now the wheel is standing, I gave gasoline, and with the gasoline, it went up. I went down again. Within three minutes, I had it. The propaganda value of a helicopter flown by an attractive woman test pilot was not lost on the Nazis. Hannah Reich flew the FA-61 every night for three weeks inside Berlin's sports hall during a trade fair in 1938. Her mastery of the art of hovering was tangible evidence of Germany's lead in vertical flight. Heinrich Fokker was not alone. By 1940, Anton Flettner had perfected a system of intermeshing rotor blades for his helicopter, the Colibri. It could reach 90 miles an hour in forward flight, and it was highly maneuverable. The Colibri could hover and even fly backwards, and it ranks as the world's first practical helicopter. It was developed for the German Navy as a shipborne submarine spotter which could operate from the gun turret of a cruiser. The Navy ordered a thousand, but as Germany's industrial capacity declined at the end of the war, they were never produced. The same fate befell Heinrich Fokker's Dragon. It had been developed from his pre-war designs as a troop carrier for the German army. 
Three were tested with light guns slung underneath. But at the end of the war, German helicopter technology passed to the Allies. War was a spur to progress in vertical flight on both sides. In America, the visionary pioneer was a Russian emigre, Igor Sikorsky. I remember a good friend of mine and a very prominent designer, uh, scientist and aviation asked, when would the helicopter go faster than the airplane? Do you know that? I said, yes, I know. The answer is never. When would the helicopter be more efficient than the airplane? Do you know that? I also said, yes, I know that. Never. But I said that helicopter will do a number of jobs which no airplane will do and which, in fact, nothing else will do except the helicopter. Sikorsky had already patented a helicopter with a single lifting rotor and tail rotors before the war. But like all the early pioneers, he suffered his share of setbacks. Igor Sikorsky was his own test pilot, and it was his work in the early 1940s which led to the helicopter as we know it today. Sikorsky learned to fly the helicopter by building a rig, and then he would operate the helicopter. A lot of development was, was experimental. You tried it. If it didn't work, you changed it in the morning. And we used to get things done within weeks because we could change things quick. Uh, Mr. Sikorsky was what I would call a beautiful person. Uh, I found him fascinating in many, many respects, and particularly in his uh, management of people and his development and maintenance of morale in his organization. Uh, he was a remarkable leader. One of the uh, very important demonstrations that we would pull was to fly up to somebody in a restricted area and have them put a suitcase or some, or a briefcase or something in the front of the ship and then back off again. This was a very important demonstration because it showed that the helicopter could do what it was supposed to do, and that is be under the complete control of the pilot at all speeds, including hovering. The helicopter came of age, literally, the helicopter era began uh, on August 14th, 1941. We had finally condensed those horizontal tail rotors at the uh, rear of the ship into a single uh, tail rotor on a tower at the tail and cyclic pitch control for controlling the ship laterally. We had taken the machine over to the Stratford airport and uh, I had uh, started feeling my way through various maneuvers very slowly, working my way into opening up what we call the flight envelope getting it going faster, making very quick stops, quick starts, uh, with not a single problem developing. And suddenly, we realized that everything was opening up for us. Sikorsky's work quickly led to a practical machine, the XR-4. The possibilities seemed limitless. The dream was that the helicopter would become a common form of transportation, and. Uh, it would be, it could be used by the public. And we thought millions of people benefiting from that. And then we thought that uh, it would be a wonderful thing for saving lives. And we thought it'd be a wonderful thing for, for other transportation of that nature, emergency transportation. But it never came to pass. The uh, development of it commercially just slowed along at a very, very slow rate and it was a takeoff from the military. The military furnished the money, they furnished the design and the, the mission requirements. 400 Sikorsky helicopters were produced before the end of the war. They were widely tested for a variety of military and naval tasks, but they were slow, they could carry only small loads, and they had no significant effect on the conduct of the war. A small number did, however, find their way into combat zones. In the Far East, British troops were fighting to reopen the Burma Road. They had American air support. A light aircraft crashed behind Japanese lines, stranding the pilot and three soldiers. American helicopters were stationed in India. 
One of the pilots was Lieutenant Carter Harmon. I remember being alarmed and somewhat unhappy about the idea of flying for 600 miles into the middle of Burma in order to pick up a plane that had gone down with an American pilot and three British casualties. Uh, when I arrived over the clearing where the casualties were hiding, I had no idea what to expect. I had never seen a jungle clearing. And I could see from the air that it was slanted, which was not a good idea. Uh, I could see at the edge of the clearing figures, human figures, crouched in the underbrush. I had to go and inspect the field. I had to fly over it slowly, called dragging the field in order to make sure that I wasn't going to fall into a hole or something. I got as close as I could to the casualties, uh, steering clear of rocks and holes, and set it down. It landed on a slight tilt, but nothing made any strange noises, so I felt that I was OK. When I got the helicopter on the ground, Murphy ran out when he said, you look like an angel. And I didn't know how to answer that. And then we loaded this very heavy man who had a terrible back wound and three samurai swords that he had liberated. And I revved it, I over revved it so we could jump into forward speed and took off down the hill, which was a help because he was heavy and flew him 10 miles to a place where I could unload him. He'd be picked up by light planes and eventually back to India. If I hadn't gone in with the helicopter, they probably, at least two of them, would have just simply died there. Sikorsky's prophecy that the helicopter could do things no other aircraft could do had been fulfilled. Sikorsky was the first, but not the only, designer experimenting with vertical flight in America. Arthur Young had been building model helicopters since before the war. With backing from the Bell Aircraft Company, he developed his simpler, twin-bladed rotor system, incorporating a stabilizing bar to govern the rotor angle. His models became increasingly stable and controllable, and in 1945, via a series of prototypes, they culminated in one of the most famous helicopters of all time, the Bell Model 47. The Bell 47, with its familiar bubble nose and the distinctive sound of its rotor blades, became one of the great lifesavers of the war in Korea. Battle casualties could be lifted out of the fighting to a mobile army surgical hospital within minutes of being hit. As a lifesaver, the helicopter had no equal. On passage from Swatow to Singapore, this Norwegian liner ran aground, a dangerous situation for the passengers. But a helicopter from the American 7th Fleet came to the rescue. It was a case of women and children first, as American sailors who boarded the liner sent the Chinese aloft to the hovering helicopter. In the 1950s, helicopters appeared in many shapes and sizes. And with the advent of the jet engine and the extra power it gave, helicopters grew bigger and bigger. The XH-17 is powered by two modified turbojet engines. Her rotor blades are 120 feet from tip to tip. This mighty aircraft is the forerunner of cargo-carrying helicopters for the American Army. The largest helicopter in the world. As well as suspending a load, it can lift up to 12 tons on a platform mounted between its four legs. The 
Sky Crane performs again, this time for the electrical transmission line industry. The nation's vast network of transmission lines is being constantly expanded with the demand for increased electrical power. The possibilities for vertical flight seem limitless. Another machine with a variety of uses is the Ferry Rotodyne, famous as the world's first vertical takeoff airline. The production version will carry 65 passengers. Now, what's all this? A cabin full of nurses gives a vivid example of the capacity of this remarkable machine. The ability to land without runways was the main attraction of helicopters. This giant Piasecki H-21 flew to the Vatican and landed in St. Peter's Square right in front of the Pope, who gave it his blessing. But helicopters were expensive and inefficient. In America, Pan American started a helicopter service from the roof of its headquarters in downtown Manhattan. But the promising future, which many people saw in helicopters, remained unfulfilled. Whatever peaceful jobs were found for it, the helicopter's main task was always as an instrument of war. The reason that the Army took helicopters was because they felt that that would give us the edge over the uh, Vietnamese that the French didn't have. The question came down to mobility. The French felt that they had mobility with their ground vehicles, and we thought that the helicopter represented a, a much greater means of mobility. As it turned out, uh, it worked very well. It, it could take an incredible amount of uh, hits and still fly. They were able to extract troops under fire from small landing zones and carry wounded and dead. As a matter of fact, I would say that the Huey helicopter in particular probably saved hundreds, if not thousands, of lives that would have otherwise been tallied as dead. The helicopter was the sound that the, the grunts hated the most and uh, loved the most. It usually meant that it was uh, either going to be carrying them into trouble or coming to pick them up or bring them food, but it was everywhere. The CH-47 Chinook was a marvelous aircraft. In Vietnam, it was used as, a, as an aerial truck that was used as an assault aircraft as well. And uh, I've had as many as 120 inside of the Chinook. It's the easiest way for us to transport material is external load means, anything that we could put in a net and resupply the troops. That was a mission, primarily um, beans and bullets, uh, et cetera, water and fuel. we did a lot is extract downed aircraft. This was done almost on a daily basis. But we'd find ourselves going in and picking up aircraft that had been very hastily abandoned and then we got back in and hastily had a crew that rigged them and we could come in and snatch these aircraft and get out of there. In many cases, we'd be taking fire while we were doing this uh, particular mission. I don't think any kind of training could adequately prepare you for Vietnam. You'd find yourself doing, uh, let's say, non-standard maneuvers in a helicopter, arrive over a fire base. You're in a hot area. Everything was a hot area, and especially if you had a unit in contact on the ground. You would have to arrive, in some cases, at altitude over that area and be able to initiate and complete a descent more or less within the perimeter of that unit that was on the ground. And you'd probably be taking fire while this was happening. you're trying to shoot, move, and communicate with all this technology you have at your fingertips, radios and weapon systems, and et cetera, and you're talking to people on the ground, and you get into a firefighter, you go into a hot LZ, 
where, whereby the guy on the ground, he's so scared he can't talk, and his voice is up about 16 octaves, and you can't understand what he's saying. You hear all the shooting in the background, and you're going in there. And in some cases, it's in the middle of the night, which complicates circumstances dramatically. You know, so, confusion. And I, I just look back on some of it, it seemed like such comedy of error in retrospect. And you wonder, how in the hell did I ever possibly survive that? One of the things about the job of flying a helicopter into a landing zone was that it was probably the most precarious job in the world that I can imagine. You were locked into this formation, and on the approach, if you received fire, you were not allowed to break away from the formation. You simply sat there and you simply flew. You made your approach, and as you got slower and slower, then you became more and more vulnerable. And as fire broke out on the ground, you still could not move from your position. You landed on the ground and you had to sit there on the ground while the people were shooting at you, waiting for the flight commander to get a signal to leave. It was probably the most nerve-wracking job in the Army. It was difficult to tell when you got a hit in a helicopter in combat because of the noise level. It was impossible, for instance, to hear bullets being shot at you. One of the first times I just simply noticed a hole in the canopy of the helicopter and realized that I had just been shot. Going through the treetops, the idea was to keep the fuselage as low as possible. That means among the treetops. Uh, I've had crew chiefs get slapped in the face by branches and so forth. I mean, that's how low we would go, we, in the trees. It was an exciting ride. Troops often let us know how excited they were about this ride <laughs> by screaming in the back. It became obvious that the Huey's rotor blade was an extremely strong piece of equipment. I found that it was able to chop down the tips of branches and so forth by accident and on several occasions. I've chopped down two inch thick branches with the Huey blade and suffered no real damage. We weren't equipped to fly formation at night. We had no special equipment and we found the best technique was to fly so close that we could actually see the glowing instrument panel of uh, the pilot we were flying on. The panel itself then would give us our reference by its uh, layout in space. And on a pitch black night, that was the only reference we had. If we dropped too far back, we'd lose sight of the guy we were flying on, which is a hell of a situation because then you don't know where to go. So we flew as tight as possible watching his instrument panel. I remember once being put in for a medal because my friend and I went to rescue some grunts on the ground in a mortar attack. And they called us and said, could we come and get him? And we had been flying for something close to 10 hours. And I was slouched up against the cockpit seat. My buddy was flying, and we both nodded. And we just kind of lacked it. They basically flew into this place under fire. The grunts scurried over with their litter and the troops on board. Mortars started coming in. People started running. And I remember not being the slightest bit afraid and just kind of almost being bored and uh, then taking off, flying over a machine gun nest, taking hits, and coming back, and it was almost like a dream. And that was how I learned that's how heroes are made. You know, it's just, I don't give a damn. You know, and then you just did it. Away from the battlefield in California, the age-old vision of a world in which helicopters would provide a means of commuting by air for the common man sometimes seems tantalizingly close. The Robinson R-22 produced in Los Angeles is bringing that world a little closer. Like many milestones in the progress of aviation, it was the dream of one man, Frank Robinson. I guess the dream was to design and develop a light helicopter that could be used by a very large segment of the population. I believe that eventually man will travel in the fastest way possible from one point to another point. And that, of course, would be in a straight line. The only vehicle we have today that can actually do that is the helicopter. It can take off from one point, travel directly to another point, and it can do so completely independent. It doesn't matter whether there's a crowded freeway or a body of water. The helicopter, of course, can travel directly over it. It requires no improvements on the surface to be able to 
transit over a given area. Clear. The R-22 has been designed to be as simple to fly as possible. But in the hands of its creator, it can put on a stunning display of maneuverability under perfect control. It has also been designed to be as economical as possible with the intention of encouraging more and more people to learn to fly helicopters. As roads become more congested, so Frank Robinson hopes people will take to the air. Actual operating cost of the R-22 compared to a to an expensive automobile uh, is really very similar. It burns really about the same amount of gasoline per mile as a expensive or fairly heavy car would burn. It's, not only a much faster mode of transportation, but it's also a much more pleasant mode of transportation. It does take longer to learn to fly a helicopter than it does to fly a light airplane and certainly to drive a car. But once you learn it, it becomes very natural, very relaxing, and requires very little effort. Landing on the top of a high building is not at all difficult. The technique is a little bit different than when you're landing on the ground. And the key to it is to concentrate on the heliport on the top of the building, and you just fly directly to it. You don't look down the edge of the building or down the sides of it, you just concentrate on the heliport itself, and it's really no different than landing on that same heliport on the ground. Many people still believe that if the engine were to fail in a helicopter, the helicopter would literally fall out of the sky and drop right down on whoever was below. And of course, this is not true at all. When an engine fails in a helicopter, the helicopter enters what is called auto rotation. And this is a glide, not unlike the glide of an airplane. The main difference is that when a helicopter is gliding down, the pilot has very, very good control of the machine. And he can pick a spot and end up not even damaging the machine. I can think of many examples where an individual could actually commute or travel with the light helicopter less expensively and certainly much faster than he could with an automobile. The world of commuter helicopters, with their emphasis on simplicity, is a very different world from some other attempts at vertical flight. Helicopters are not the only aircraft which goes straight up. In the 1950s, the goal was to build a fighter which could take off and land vertically. One of the first was the Convair XFY-1, known as the Pogo. Nobody wanted to fly it. There were no volunteers. But the more I learned about the airplane, the more I thought it was a, a successful concept. It could be worked out. In uh, retrospect, uh, I guess it was quite dangerous. But it was a developmental power plant. It was a developmental airplane, a developmental concept, and pretty hard to tie all those together without having a lot of risk. We're going to depart from the conventional procedure. Excuse me, I have to go. The cockpit is quite a bit up off the ground, and to get into it, I had to have special ladders to get in and out and to get hooked up. It had a single jet engine driving two propellers in opposite directions to stop the engine from turning the aircraft instead. The day came for the first flight. That was a pretty tense moment because there were a lot of people, around 3,000 people from Washington and around, and uh, we really had an untried airplane at that point as far as transitional flight is concerned. I guess you just 
push to go, so to speak. It, it just came up like when you run skis, rising up out of water. Just beautiful transition. Everything went as planned. Skeets Coleman climbed to 4,000 feet. In level flight, the Pogo flew more or less like a conventional aircraft. Of course, then the problem was getting back. That was a lot of worry, mainly because the airplane was so fast and I couldn't slow it down. I just left my chase plane behind. And we estimated that flight idle, I was doing 300 knots. When I was at 100 knots, I was committed. Pulled it up, pulled back the power, and said, here we go. Just as I get to the vertical, I add power and hope I'm not still soaring. At that point, I have to look over my shoulder and quit looking at the flight instruments. From now on, I'm doing nothing but looking over my shoulder at the ground below. critical in vertical rate of descent. At about 20 feet per second, it would tumble. And when I get to the spot that I want to land on, I just hover there and then bring it down and bring the throttle fully back, which puts the prop in a beta position and gives you some negative lift and makes sure you stay solidly on the ground. The first flight over, Skeets had only one emotion. Relief, <laughs> a lot of relief because I was very tired after the first one. I'd had to back down from about 700 feet. And uh, if it hadn't been some helicopters around there on the first flight helping me back down, I would never have made it. The Pogo was never adapted as a fighter, but America persisted with the concept of an aircraft which could make the transition from vertical to horizontal flight and back on one set of engines. The Ryan X-13 was jet powered. Once again, it required great skill and concentration on the part of the pilot, particularly on landing, which was made against a specially prepared tower. A different approach was to use two separate sets of engines, one to lift the aircraft, the other to power it in forward flight. The French Balzac used this layout, and it was equipped with a total of nine engines. In Britain, Rolls-Royce used two jet engines to lift the extraordinary flying bedstead to research vertical flight. And the Shorts SC-1 used five engines, four of them for lift. None of these designs turned out to be practical. The answer lay in a completely new idea. Britain's Harrier, or Jump Jet as it's popularly known, is the result of many years of research. Today, it remains the Western world's only vertical takeoff fighter. The key to its success is vectored thrust, which enables the pilot to vary the direction of his jet from horizontal to vertical. It has been in service with the Royal Air Force since 1969 as a ground attack fighter capable of operating close to the army from hides in almost any terrain. The Harrier started as a result of the climate in the, in the late 50s towards VTOL. It was just another attempt at creating a military jet that could leave the ground vertically because of the uh, anticipated vulnerability of runways. It's basically a very simple aircraft with one engine used for vertical flight and the same motor is used in horizontal flight. 
and you couldn't get simpler than that. All the configurations that use separate engines for liftoff have all died. They've all been uh, ruined by history. Weight was dominant all the time. We sweated blood to keep the weight out of the aeroplane. But that aside, the special engineering problem were really in the, in the VSOL systems, the system that, that uh, rotates the nozzles and the system that the pilot uses to control the aeroplane when he's in the hover. One month before I was due to fly this very important aeroplane in my life, it looked as if I was going to miss it because in Germany, when I was demonstrating a hunter, I was being driven home by a not very capable driver. He hit some trees. I smashed my ankle, and there I was in hospital thinking I was going to lose this chance of a lifetime. Anyway, plastered ankle the following morning, I managed to persuade the surgeon to allow me to go back to England in my hunter. I hopped everywhere. I wouldn't use crutches. I drove my motor car. I flew dual in every airplane and helicopter I could lay my hands on. And eventually, the Central Medical Board gave me a category, unique in aviation history, of fit civil test pilot, tethered, hovering only. And that is exactly how I started that program. The first tethered flight was in October 1960. And I remember opening the throttle and the aeroplane bumping around a little bit and suddenly there was a feeling of being off the ground. Uh, subsequently, I think it was proved that we were, we lifted off and the tethers actually were stabilizing the aeroplane. And then we put it back on the ground and that was the very first tethered hover that we did. The tethers were removed the following month and Bill Bedford worked towards making the first transition to forward flight in March 1961. We lifted off on this day and I suppose that really was one of the most exciting moments to feel the concept being fulfilled as the aircraft accelerated so smoothly, just like a brick sliding along virgin ice through to a wingborne flight. And we realized we'd done it. We realized then that we had made the important step forward and proved the basic concept, although there was a very large amount of development work that had to be done to refine it for operational use. By 1963, the vectored thrust system had been thoroughly tested. Hawker, the manufacturers, were eager to show off their new aircraft at the Paris Air Show that year, where it would be seen against its French rival, the Balza. Bill Bedford began his display with a superb demonstration of his machine's versatility. I completed my decelerating transition, was in the middle of a uh, pirouette when suddenly the bottom fell out of my lift and I felt myself plummeting earthwards and ignominiously I crashed in front of the president's tent on the concrete platform with a progressive disintegration of the undercarriage and very expensive noises taking place. The crash was only a minor setback. Bedford had already shown that the Harrier concept had a wide range of applications, including the ability to operate from ships. True to say that some of our friends in the Navy at the time who are fighting to retain the large aircraft carrier were not wildly enthusiastic in 1963 when we did the first trial on board HMS Ark Royal. And uh, I remember the flag officer aircraft carriers, Admiral Donald Gibson, kindly said, Bill, the thing that impressed me most was the complete absence of fright on the part of the spectators. New aeroplanes normally come aboard bigger, heavier and faster, and here was a complete reversal of the trend. As far as I'm concerned, it's far better to stop and land than land and try and stop. The Harrier was eventually developed as a naval fighter as well. 
Using a ramp on the flight deck, it could take off with a heavier payload than in vertical flight. By then, the Americans had expressed an interest. We had been invited by the British Aerospace people to come to the Farnborough Air Show and observe it. Uh, we made the request that we fly it. Uh, that uh, set them back a little bit, uh, thinking that because they had so few of them at the time, but it was very well important for us to take a look at the airplane to take possibilities. We expected to get three or four flights each, maybe, uh, and uh, at the last day of the Farnborough show, Bill Bedford came up to me and he said, well, we're very sorry, but we're only uh, received permission to allow you 10 flights each. Well, we kind of swallowed and uh, uh, smiled and said, well, we, we figure we can get along with that, so thank you very much. totally sold on the fact that it was the answer to what we've been looking for in the high-performance aircraft, provide close air support for the, uh, the Marine on the ground. It far exceeded anything else that was on the drawing boards that we knew of. The Marines were totally convinced that uh, the Harrier was for them and uh, remain so today. The Harrier was developed for the United States Marine Corps as the AV-8. It is one of the mainstays of the Marines' close support squadrons and is now a much larger and more potent fighter than the early Harriers. The Harrier remains the only aircraft of its kind. I think it's still the world's most misunderstood fighter. You have to recollect and remember that uh, 98 or 9 percent of the world's air force fly CTOL, conventional takeoff and landing, and there is an enormous investment in airfields and airplanes that do that. And you can't change the direction of a military service very quickly. So when the Harrier comes along and, and it opens up the possibility of moving your tactical aeroplanes away from bases, because those bases are vulnerable in war, uh, naturally the chief of an air force thinks, well, OK, maybe I do need Harriers, but what about all these other jets I'm, I'm buying and operating? You know, what are my masters, my president, and my politicians going to think if I effectively send the message? They may not be there when we need them, because the runways could be denied. And that's the Harrier's worst enemy, I think. But helicopters and Harriers are no longer the only types of aircraft which can fly vertically. Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, the aircraft that will take flight to a new dimension, the V-22 Osprey. The Osprey achieves the transition from vertical to horizontal flight by tilting its rotors. Like the Harrier, it is the only example of its kind. The idea for a tilt rotor aircraft is not new. The first designs were made before the war. They were called converted planes. It's only with more recent technical advances in aerodynamics and materials that such aircraft have become a reality. The first tilt rotors flew in 1955 in America. That early work culminated in 1977 with the first flight of the technology demonstrator, the XV-15. Developing a completely new type of aircraft is a very long-term undertaking. The XV-15 was only made possible by the sustained research work over 30 years by many individuals working in several companies under the auspices of NASA and the Department of Defense. The idea behind Tilt Rudder was that you could combine the best assets of a helicopter and a fixed-wing airplane and do the job of two different types of aircraft in one. The advantages of tilt rotor over a helicopter and, and conventional fixed wing is that a, a helicopter will be cruising normally 140, 150 knot range. 
we're cruising at 275 to 280 knots. So the, the speed of a tilt rotor is roughly twice that of a conventional helicopter. At the same time, the power required is much less, so you're burning a lot less fuel than a helicopter would. A tilt rotor is more efficient because, unlike a helicopter, the fixed wing provides lift, leaving all the power of the rotors to be converted into forward speed. The uh, XV-15 was in New York in the summer of 84, and we made a flight from Battery Park, which is lower Manhattan, direct flight to Bowling Air Force Base, Washington, DC, which is about a 200-mile a flight. And we made it in about 45 minutes, point to point. Uh, that same flight, if you originated in downtown Manhattan, it would have been at least a 45-minute cab ride to the major airport in order to catch a shuttle flight. So your round trip to Washington might have been on the order of two and a half hours. The XV-15 has proved the technology of tilt rotor. It has also shown the enormous practical value of aircraft which can fly directly between two points at high speed. That ability signals one path towards a solution to the ever-increasing congestion on runways, in the airways, and at airport terminals today. I think the tilt rotor has advantages that will capture a large percentage of the helicopter market as we know today, and it will also take some of the roles of fixed wing market. It will create a niche in its own right between the two aircraft. It won't replace totally either one, but it will create a whole new industry. The tilt rotor embodies both the dreams and the technical breakthroughs of the early pioneers of vertical flight. Their ultimate vision is on the threshold of fulfillment. With the Osprey, tilt rotor is moving from the experimental phase to the military phase. And there is little doubt that in the decades ahead, airline passengers will find tilt rotors commonplace.